talks given by Stephanie Weiner. Steph uh, was working in the hacking community on various things for a while, and then she decided to do more theoretical research. Um, she got her PhD in Amsterdam and is now a postdoc at Caltech in sunny California. And she's going to tell us uh, how to use quantum mechanics and noise to do cryptography. Okay, well, thanks, Chris, for the introduction. Um, yeah, in my former life, I did more practical things. For example, I worked for Job at IT6. Um, and I'm going to talk about quantum cryptography and, in fact, what goes beyond using it for key distribution, as Vadim was talking about yesterday. And, in fact, I will talk about how to make the most of noise, something which normally is actually bad for us. So I have worked with a lot of different people on this, uh, on this uh, subject. Christian is here. You just saw him. So you can talk to him later. Um, and before I actually talk about any quantum things, let me explain to you what the problem is that we are trying to solve. So we want to implement two-party protocols between two parties, Alice and Bob. And all the problems that I will be considering are of the following form. So Alice and Bob have agreed on some function. So this function is known to both of them. Alice herself has some input x, which is unknown to Bob. And Bob has some input y, which is unknown to Alice. And at the end of the day, they want to compute the function of f of x and y. Um, is the mic not working? I cannot really tell from here. Mic is working? OK, great. OK. So that's what I want to do. However, there is a little bit of a problem. Namely, Alice does not actually trust Bob. So she wants to make sure that whatever he can do, he can only learn the output of this function, but nothing more about her original input x. And at the same time, Bob is quite suspicious of Alice, and he wants to be sure that Alice cannot learn his input y. Okay. So you might say, why is this uh, interesting? So I want to give you some examples of problems which are of this form. So maybe I should also say, I mean, of course, in, in reality, they don't have such a beautiful box, but they have to solve this problem by talking over a channel, say a classical or, in fact, a quantum channel. So going to the example, maybe Bob, after he's had enough of camping, wants to sell his tent and places an ad for a slightly used tent. And Alice is potentially interested in buying this tent. And she has in her mind, looking at this picture, maybe it should be worth 40 euros. Bob has in his mind, ah, this is much worse, worth much more, maybe it's 120 euros. And for example, one possible function they could wish to evaluate is the following. So if Alice is willing to pay less than some minimum asking price that Bob puts in, so he wants to have at least 120 euros, then we'll output no and we'll reject the transaction. And otherwise, we'll output, in fact, the price that Alice has suggested. And Bob is going to be happy with everything above his minimum asking price. So this problem is of this form. Um, other problems, which are also, I mean, potentially quite interesting, and in fact, Job has been going on about it in his talk. Namely, Alice wants to identify herself to Bob, possibly some ATM machine or a building, and she holds a password or some kind of pin code. And so she walks up to the machine and says, hey, I'm Alice. I claim I have a certain password. And ideally, you would like to have something that works as this following box here. So Alice would input her password. Bob, if he would be really an ATM machine, can look up what password Alice should have. And he inputs this in this box. And out comes yes and no. Yes, if the both are the same, and no otherwise. And so clearly there's some obvious security constraints. Maybe Bob is not really an ATM machine, but something someone else has placed there. So you want to be sure that Bob cannot learn the password if he doesn't know it already, more than by just guessing one and checking whether it worked. And similarly for Alice, if Alice is not actually Alice, she does not really know the password, 
all she should be able to do is to guess a password and find out whether it worked. So these are the kind of problems we're interested in solving. And let's maybe see how this should be possible. Unfortunately, it's impossible to do this if Alice and Bob, where all they have is some classical or even quantum communication line and thus no other resources. But it does become possible under some classical assumptions. For example, that factoring is difficult. So factoring, I guess all of you know, I have a number, usually larger than 15, and I want to know what are its prime factors. So as Vadim mentioned yesterday, this can be done efficiently on a quantum computer. Um, and in fact, it's not even known classically whether this assumption is really correct. And actually, as you just saw from Job, there is many other attacks on a smart card that go far beyond this, which are more practical. So some other assumption one can make is that classical storage is bounded. So I cannot store too many bits. Now you might say, this is possibly quite unrealistic. I have a hard drive which has, I don't know, how many gigabytes. Um, so this is not a very believable assumption. So a natural assumption is to assume that, in fact, we don't consider classical storage, but we consider quantum storage. So I want to store quantum bits. And that I should not be able to store too many. Or in fact, more generally, that my storage is imperfect. And what I will call noisy. And I will tell you in a second what exactly I mean by that. So maybe to tell you why this assumption is a bit more realistic than classical storage, uh, what is the state of the art of quantum memories today? So there's two places where actually noise can occur. Normally, in our setting, quantum bits will be encoded in some photon. And you want to store this over a long period of time. Generally, you can convert it to something else, for example, some atomic ensemble. And already in this conversion, something can go wrong. In addition, even if you have managed to actually convert it and store it, there can be errors in storage. And in, in, actually, the best memories that are available today can store a small handful of qubits and assuming that I've made this conversion, they can stay in this storage for about a millisecond. So quantum storage is not very advanced yet, and we will actually make use of that. Okay. So I want to talk a bit about noisy storage. So what does it mean to have noisy storage? Then, of course, uh, I guess what you've all been waiting for, namely, we will talk about quantum things, in particular, uncertainty relations. Then I will introduce a small uh, uh, cryptographic building block that we'll consider, and I'll sketch you a protocol for it and try to give you some intuition about why this can work. OK. So what is noisy storage? In order to talk about this, I want to talk about sending information over a channel. So some things you're all familiar with. For example? Say I have the identity channel. And what it does is I input one bit, and exactly the same bit comes out. So this is great. It works perfectly. But channels may, in general, um, not be quite as nice as this one. For example, a very simple classical channel is where I input a bit. And in here, you can imagine that we flip a coin with some probability, maybe a half. And if we succeed, then indeed we output the original bit, so here zero. But there is some chance that we'll actually output the wrong bit. So this is an example of a noisy channel. And you may be wondering, because I'm talking about storage, how does do these channels actually relate to noise in storage? Is that you can think about all the noise that happens in memory as a noisy channel. So again, where can the noise happen? There's basically two main sources. First, when we actually put something into storage, or when we get something out of storage. Or second, noise can also happen over time. So I already stored something, 
but you can think of this bit which is stored on your hard drive passing through a noisy channel just because time passes and this errors can happen. Okay. So now I want to send not just one bit but many bits. So if I send many bits and I have the identity channel, all is great, out comes what I put in. If I actually input um, the bits here, but I have a bit flip channel here, then the transmission is unreliable. So sometimes what comes out is not actually what we put in. And I guess you're all familiar with this. And in fact, clearly you can make transmission reliable. What's something we are all intuitively familiar with? Namely, we can use error correction. So suppose we have many bits, m bits. We could encode it somehow. We'll send it through all these channels that we have available. And afterwards, we do some decoding where we correct the errors that have happened. So I wanted to introduce two important quantities, namely that depend on some, namely how many bits we put in here and how many channels we have. So say we have m bits and we have some number of channels, so num some number of, say, storage bits. And let's say, for example, that we have many input bits, 1,000, and I have only one channel. So you can think of, I can only store one bit, and that one may be also a bit noisy. So do you expect this to work? I guess probably not. And so it depends on what is called the rate namely the number of bits that we want to send per channel use. So here's the number of bits m and the number of channels m. And the point I want to make here is that error correction schemes cannot be arbitrarily good, as you probably expect. So this here is the rate, and with every channel, there's something called the capacity, and it has the following property. If we try to send not too many bits per channel use, so the rate is smaller than this number called the capacity, then we can transmit reliably, so what goes out is exactly what comes in. But if the rate is greater than the capacity, then in fact there exists no error correction schemes, so there's nothing you could possibly do such that you get exactly out what you put in. So there are some limitations um, inherent in this problem and your error correction schemes cannot be arbitrarily good. And in fact, it gets even worse. Namely, as you are above capacity, so if, there, if you try to send too many bits, then your chance of reconstruction, so the, the, your probability that in fact you'll manage to get out exactly what comes in, goes to zero if you try to send very many bits and the number of channels is large. So I guess the point I want to make here is that given only a certain number of, uh, of, of noisy uh, storage bits, we cannot arbitrarily send arbitrarily many bits. I guess that's intuitive. And in fact, the important thing is that not only can we not send in arbitrarily many bits, our chance of really getting out exactly what we put in is negligible. Okay. Now one can show, in fact, we have shown that the same holds for a large class of quantum channels. I don't want to talk about this, but the intuition is the same here. If the rate is above the capacity, we are in really bad shape. Okay. So I can now explain to you exactly what the assumption is we're going to make. So if a party is cheating, we allow him to be computationally all powerful. Maybe in the basement he has a quantum computer, he can perform all error correction, he can break RSA, um, he has an unlimited amount of classical storage. All his actions happen sort of instantaneous, any encoding procedure, so there's no storage involved there. However, he does have noisy quantum storage. So what we will do is in the protocol, there will be certain waiting times. Say we wait for two milliseconds, at which point the noise accumulates in storage. And so what the adversary can do, so here he has some information, maybe he has some qubits, 
maybe some classical bits. He can measure them, whatever he wants. Like I said, he may have a quantum computer. So he can store as much classical information as he wants. But his quantum information has to use this noisy storage. So he has some number of these noisy storage channels. Um, and I will tell you later what this number means. And he can perform an arbitrary encoding, whatever he wants. Okay. So this is what we're going to assume. Now, as I said, we're going to actually use uh, quantum to achieve this. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, what are quantum bits, and in particular, what are uncertainty relations. So, I mean, maybe one, some of you have come to Vadim's talk yesterday, and one possible way to encode a classical bit into what's called a qubit, a quantum bit, is in that we encode it into the state of some photon. So say we choose a particular encoding, and it has the property that if we measure it, knowing the encoding, we get out exactly what we put in. You say, this is not very exciting. But unlike in classical bits, there exist more than one ways to do such an encoding into a photon. And some, some of these different encodings have very interesting properties. So I will just tell you what the properties are. So I will use a blue encoding and a red encoding. So for example, these are different polarization directions of the photon. And all of them have the property that if I say choose the red encoding, and I perform the red measurement, then I get out exactly what I put in. Okay. Now, let me say a bit about what the peculiar properties of these quantum bits are. So unlike in classical bits, we cannot just copy them. It's going to be very important. And these two encodings actually also have some quite funny properties. So we can choose, for example, a blue encoding and a red encoding. They're such that, say, I've chosen the blue encoding here, but now I perform a measurement assuming the red encoding, and I don't get back what I put in, but with some probability half I get a zero, and with some probability half I get the one. We can also turn this around, of course. To say I've actually chosen the red encoding, but now I'm going to measure assuming the blue encoding, and again I get with probability half zero, and with probability half I get a one. Okay. Um, well, I can. I guess I can hold the microphone. That's maybe okay. Okay, thanks. So maybe to say now for the people can actually understand me, I wasn't aware. So if I choose the red encoding, but I make a measurement assuming the blue one, I don't get out what I put in, but I get with probability half a zero and with probability half a one. Okay. So to explain uncertainty relations, let's imagine we're going to play the following game. I'm going to choose a bit with probability half. So I flip a coin, and I get either a zero or one. And I do the same thing again. So I will flip a coin, and I will choose either the blue or the red encoding. And I challenge Bob to guess my bit. So say I've chosen bit zero, and maybe I've chosen the blue encoding. So I sent it to Bob, and Bob can you do anything that he wants. Maybe he has a quantum computer. I'm not sure what he does. But whatever he does, so he'll output some classical bit, but the probability that he really manages to make that bit equal to my input is quite small, or rather, it's not too big. Namely, he only had to, has an 85% chance of being correct if he does not know that I've used the blue encoding. Okay. So knowing the encoding of the bit is evidently important. 
And it will be true, it will be important for us that in fact Bob cannot do any better. Even if I let him do anything he wants here, he can output something. And later I'm actually gonna tell him, Bob, I've used the blue encoding. And this is not going to help him at all. The, the probability that he will be correct is still 85%. Okay. You might wonder where is this going and why is this important? Let's compare the cases where I have storage and where I have not storage. So again, so say I've chosen zero and the blue encoding and Bob could store it on some quantum hard drive. So then later, when I tell him, I've, hey Bob, I've chosen the blue encoding, he can perform the blue measurement and get out exactly my bit with probability one. So with storage, perfect success. Let's look at what happens without storage. So I sent this to Bob. He can do anything he wants, any computation, but he has no quantum storage. So out comes the classical bit. And later I'm going to tell him, hey, I had the blue encoding, and he can perform any measurement or operation that he wants on the classical bit and the fact that I tell him I've chosen the blue encoding. And still, here he has only 85% being correct, so maybe he manages to guess correctly that I have a zero, but sometimes he'll output a one. So without storage, he cannot do it perfectly. So maybe I should make a remark, because you may have been wondering where do these uncertainty relations come from. Uncertainty relations cannot really apply only to measurements, but they can also apply to encodings. And namely, this is exactly what we're doing here when we talk about the red and the blue encoding. So now that we know what happens with and without storage, of course, the obvious question is, what happens if we have some storage? So say, we do this many, many times. Sometimes I choose a zero, a one, at random, and sometimes I'll choose the red or sometimes I'll choose the blue encoding. I'll send this all to Bob. Bob, like I said, he can do any encoding he wants. He may have some kind of quantum computer. But he only has, can store using some noisy storage, k times m of these bits. So k here can be some number, for example, maybe a half, but it can also be greater than one, so it could also be that he has twice as many channels here as the bits that I sent him. So, like I said, so there is actually some chance that Bob succeeds, even if he does not know the encoding that I've used. So some of these bits over here are equal to the original input. So, for example, this one, and that one, and the one down here. But some of them will be incorrect. And, in fact, one can show that an uncertainty relation, now not applied to measurements, but to encodings, tells you something about the rate at which Bob has to send information through his storage. But we had just realized that if the rate is too big, namely it's greater than the capacity, or in fact, if we use so many channels, it will in this case tell us that if the rate which is a half, so this comes from some uncertainty relation, is greater than k times the capacity, then in fact the probability that Bob really manages to guess the entire string goes to zero, as m is large. So he may know some of the bits, but surely there are going to be also some bits that he does not know. So I guess you're all familiar, so it will go, so this here is m, this here is the probability, so as m goes large, this goes to zero. You may ask, how quickly does it go to zero? I don't really want to talk about it. It depends, of course, on what the channel is here and also what this number k is. So it may go a bit quicker, like over here, but also it may be a bit slower. Okay. So now that I've talked about some quantum ingredients that we're using and how they're related. 
to noisy storage. I want to introduce, a, I mean, it's a well-known primitive, a cryptographic billing block that will allow us to make this other primitive. But it's going to be much simpler. And it's called one out of two oblivious transfer. And the name comes from the following. Namely, Alice has two inputs, S0 and S1. So these can be strings of a certain length. Bob has some input C. This is just one bit. And it labels the one of the two, which of the two uh, bits Bob actually wants to know. So this, as an idealized box, it should work in the following way. Alice inputs her two strings into this box. Bob inputs his choice bit C. And Bob can learn S sub C. So he can learn the bit he wants. The security conditions here mean that Alice can learn nothing about C. So we, she does not learn which of the two bits Bob wants. And at the same time, Bob can learn not more than one of the two bits. So there's always one of the two that he is ignorant about. So like I said, these are the conditions. And you may wonder, why is this at all interesting? How does this fit with the previous problem? So let's imagine that we have some function that outputs just one bit. Uh, I mean, the output can be longer, but Bob's input here is just one bit. So note that this is a, we could easily make this from this one out of Leafy's transfer. So Alice inputs, her first input is just her own input. And if Bob would have input zero. And the second one is this function applied to her input and Bob's e input equal to one. So she doesn't know, of course, which of the two inputs Bob has, but Bob can now retrieve the one that corresponds to his input Y. And so the conditions are that in fact, Bob can learn nothing, uh, Alice can learn nothing about Y, so she doesn't know which one Bob has, and Bob can learn nothing more than just S sub Y. Okay, thank you. Okay. So let's give you a very rough idea about how a protocol for such a thing can now be built uh, from using quantum bits. Um, and I want, just want to tell you the main three steps, which are the following. So first, we're going to generate a very long string, which is shared by Alice and Bob. And it will have the property that Alice knows all of the bits, but Bob only knows some of them, and not too many. Then we'll split the string into two parts, and it's possible to do this in such a way that Bob knows one of the two parts, but not the other. But he may still know a little bit about the other part. So in the final step, we'll actually shrink the, sh the strings down to something much smaller, and this will have the nice property that Bob knows one of them, but he really knows nothing about the other. Okay. So let's start with that. So let me again recap what is what we're trying to achieve. So what we're trying to do now in the first step of the protocol is to build something that sort of works like the orange box here. So to Alice, it will spit out a long string, x1 to xn, and Bob will get some set i, so this is some subsets of the bits from one to n, and x sub i, so this is the string x at the positions in the set i. So we want to do this in such a way that Alice does not learn which of the bits Bob knows. And Bob cannot guess the entire string. So he may know something about it, but not too much. So for example, we can imagine that the n-bit string which is generated is say 0, 1, 0, and so on. And Bob knows some bits about it. So for example, he knows, has this index at i, so he knows that he knows the bit 1, bit 3, and bit 4 as an example. Now, obviously, we're going to use the encodings that we just talked about. And in fact, the quantum part of the protocol will be exactly that. So we're going to do this n times. 
And in each round, I'm going to flip a coin, and I will choose a bit at random. And I will also choose an encoding, either red or blue. So actually, Vadim, since you're sitting there, this is exactly what happens in the first step of quantum key distribution, only we'll do some different classical post-processing. So we do this many times, and each step, we'll send it over to Bob. Now Bob is also going to flip a coin, and he's going to measure it either using the blue or the red box. Of course, he doesn't know which encoding he chose, so he just picks one at random. And they do this many, many times, and Bob is going to write down in each step what was his measurement outcome, and also whether he chose the red or the blue measurement. So, like I said, there will be waiting times. Now we're going to wait maybe two milliseconds. And after this, Alice will in fact tell Bob which encodings she's chosen. So in this example, she'll send him blue, red, red, blue, and so on. Now, as we noticed before, if Bob measures uh, in the same color as Alice had chosen in her encoding, then he'll retrieve this bit perfectly. So say if Alice measured, encoded a blue, and Bob happened to measure blue, he'll retrieve the bit, and otherwise he'll get something random. So this means that in fact he knows some of the bits, namely the ones where by accident he chose the same encoding. And because Alice tells him the encodings, he can now write down which, which rounds he had in fact chosen the same encoding, and these are the bits that he knows. So out comes a string x1 up to xn. So this is the string that Alice generates herself here. And out comes some set. So this is like where Bob measured in the same color, say 1, 4, and 5. And Bob also writes down the bits from these rounds. So I mean, one important thing to emphasize here is that there is no storage needed for the honest parties. So you don't need any quantum storage, or in fact, no quantum computer to execute this protocol. So what happens? So we said that in the first step, we already want to be sure that Alice cannot learn which of the two bits Bob has received. But this is indeed quite intuitive, because note that communication only ever went from Alice to Bob and nothing ever went back in the other direction. So I guess it's intuitive that indeed there's no way for Alice to learn anything because she has not received any information from Bob. But what happens if Bob is dishonest? So in this case, we are exactly in the setting that we looked at earlier. So we sent many of these bits and Bob has some kind of storage, so he may have a quantum computer do any encoding he wants, but he only has some number of noisy storage channels at his disposal. And note that the uncertainty relation tells us that if the rate here, if the, if the capacity here of this channel is too low, then in fact the probability that Bob guesses the entire string, so every single bit is correct, goes to zero when we have a very large number of bits. So this is how this assumption of storage together with the uncertainty relation comes in. So the uncertainty relation tells us something about how much information we need to send through the storage. And then the capacity, the lim inherent limitations of the storage tell us that in fact the probability goes to zero. Okay. So maybe let's recall what we have achieved in the first step of the protocol. Alice has a string. Bob also has a string, and he knows some of the bits. So the green bits are the ones that he knows. And then there's some red ones that, I don't know, doesn't know, he measured in the wrong color. So let's go to step two. Namely, we'll subdivide this string into two parts. And our goal will be that Bob can know one of them, but he knows quite little about the other. So let me just recall, I guess it's clear, that if Bob cannot guess the entire string, 
then there will be some bits that he does not know. So there exist such bits. And there exists a primitive, I will only tell you exactly what it does, called interactive hashing, that does the following. So Bob inputs which are the bits that he knows. Say bit three, four, and five, and so on. This primitive will subdivide the string, the total string, into two parts. And it'll output two sets. So this is some sets of bits A, say one, four, five, and some set B, say two, three, six. So the crucial thing here, that it's possible to do this in such a way that the following two things are true. First of all, Alice does not know which of these two sets contains the bits that Bob knows. But Bob knows exactly which of the two sets contains the bit that he, Bob, he knows. And in fact, one of he will know all the bits in one of these two sets. But we can do this in such a way that in fact he knows only a few of the bits in the other set. So maybe to make a picture, what we do is the following. So we'll subdivide the string. So this is, say, the entire string. And say we'll pick these two guys to be in the first set and these two in the second set. So Alice has no idea. But Bob, say, in this case, knows all the bits in the first set. But in the second set here, there's, we have one that he doesn't know. But maybe he still knows something. So here he knows this one. And so the final step will be that he'll get rid of this something, namely by doing some kind of hashing. So I would like to emphasize that this is a, a different form of hashing that may, you may be used to than be using SHA-1 or all these things. Um, namely, it's called two universal hashing. And in fact, a very s inefficient, though simple way could be you could pick an, a, a function at random from a large number of bits to say a small number of bits as output. Okay. I don't really want to say how this works, but Alice is going to pick at random some hash function. She's going to tell Bob, this is the one that we're gonna use, and they hash it down, so it becomes much smaller. And uh, intuitively, this is what's gonna happen. So here we had the string. This is what we had after subdividing it. Now we're going to shrink it down, so into some smaller set A, something smaller B. And here we now have the property that if Bob knew all the bits, then he in fact also knows the outcome. But if there were some bits in there that he didn't know, then in fact he will know absolutely nothing about what comes out here. Now, you maybe see where this is headed, but yeah? Uh, so I have not explained the protocol. It's actually an interactive protocol. And they will together slowly decide how they will subdivide the string. Um, <laughs> but it's a classical protocol. There's nothing quantum going on. Uh, but we can talk about it later. OK. So before I want to conclude, let me remind you what we actually wanted to do. So we wanted to implement this funny primitive called one out of two Vliegis transfer. So Alice had these two inputs. And Bob wanted to know one of them. So maybe it's clear what we're going to do now. Namely, we're going to use the strings that we now painfully generated as a key to encrypt the information sent from Alice to Bob. So this is the key, say, that we could maybe use for S0, and this one we could maybe use for S1. So let's for the moment assume that, so here Bob has, knows everything about the first set, so he'll say, do nothing to Alice. And Alice is going to XOR her input S0 with the bits in this set, and XOR her input S1 with the bits in the other set. So these are keys, we'll use them as a one-time pad, and I guess it's clear because Bob knows this bit here, or the bits in the set, he can then reconstruct a zero. And he knows nothing in here, so because he does not know the key to the one-time pad, he also knows nothing about S1. Say we're in the other case, 
where here Bob knows all the bits in set A, but really he wanted to have um, her second input, so he'll tell Alice, okay, swap. Note that this does not leak any information because she, Alice knows nothing about what bit Bob wants to begin with. And then she'll just do the, do the opposite. So she'll use this guy here to encrypt her first input, and she'll use this one to encrypt her second input. And again, because I mean these are keys to a one-time path, this will all work. So Bob can compute the one he's interested in. So to conclude, I would like to mention, you were probably thinking, this is completely crazy. Um, no quantum computers have been built yet. Maybe it will take another 50 years before we can do so. But I'd like to emphasize that this can actually be done. Of course, there's some practical issues um, without a quantum computer. So we do not need to implement a quantum computer. Actually, all you need is the same kind of hardware or maybe improved <laughs> detectors that Vadim was talking about yesterday in his talk. In particular, we will also not need to store any quantum information. So we don't need any storage. It's only assumed that if you want to cheat and break the protocol, you need quantum storage to do so. And the goal, of course, say, if you think about this task of identification, is to make this very tiny. Say, maybe as big as this laser pointer, where you have some keypads on the laser pointer, and you punch in your pin code, and it will execute this quantum scheme with the machine. Now, you may also say, this sounds completely futuristic, but in fact, people are working on nanoscale lasers, which could potentially be used for this. Um, so this is not uh, something which is maybe really futuristic. Um, but it can actually be done. So this uh, concludes my talk, and I'm happy to, uh, to have any questions now, or also, of course, after my talk. I'm still around. Yeah? Thank you very much. So in the final uh, step, you have Bob, sent this information to Alice, but these were the shared bits. Presumably, uh, Bob needs to also uh, XOR that with a random value to prevent Alice from knowing its choice, because these Alice does know these bits, so she can compare. Uh, so that's what one of your late, uh, the last slide of the protocol. Are you saying why I can do the swap operation? No, I, I'm saying, so they generate these shared bits and then mm -hmm. compress them uh, to the hashing. And then Alice has two bits, and uh, uh, Bob has two bits, except one of them he uh, doesn't know, so he only knows one of them. Mm -hmm. And he se sends that choice or swapped to Alice. But then Alice can uh, compare those. It can see. Bob does not send the bits to Alice. Um, maybe this was a, a bit fast. Let me see where the slide is. So the, the key bits. Um, no, Bob does not send the key bits to Alice, of course. Uh, let's see. How do I Yeah, I have too many animations in my slides, obviously. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's skip to the last slide and then go back. Okay. Oops, finally. So let's go back to this slide. Um, and you were wondering, does, can Alice compare? But note that Bob yeah. does not send these guys to Alice. She only tells her whether she, he wants to, Alice to do this one oh. or whether he wants Alice to do this one. But he does not send the key, of course, to Alice. Sorry okay. if that was maybe a bit fast. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, sorry, another stupid question maybe, but you assume that Bob can do anything but 
store the quantum state longer than a millisecond. Why this seems to me a little bit arbitrary just to assume this. Let's say if Bob can do everything but the storage, uh, why do you choose this? I don't, I don't really get this. Why do we choose this assumption? Well, I mean, we choose this assumption because it's kind of realistic, because like I said, I mean, the best memories today can do one millisecond. And the thing is, theoretically, it's easy to think about, well, easy, it's one approach to think about this as a coding problem. And the reason, and when I say he can do anything in advance, what it means is he can perform any error correcting encoding that's possible. Um, so that's what it means that he can do anything beforehand. Uh, yeah. Um. Chris, can you give him the microphone? Oh, no? Okay. Hi. Um, so the assumption that no information is passed from Bob to Alice in the first stage of the protocol. Um, if what if Alice has entangled all of the bits that she sends to all of the qubits that she sends to Bob, and then stores the in the entangled kind of pair counterparts in her own storage, which is also noisy. She only needs to extract one of those to determine which set Bob's chosen, right? So, I mean, surely Alice can send entangled qubits to Bob. I mean, it's not all so simple as I have just described. But the intuition is that there's no information coming from Alice to Bob. You want, in some sense, which is a problem in quantum protocols, other than in classical protocols, that the protocol is completed at the end, after the final message. And in the quantum case, that's not necessarily the case, because as you say, maybe Alice sends something entangled, and somewhere two years down the road, she's going to measure it. Um, so there are some few things, but it can be addressed. Uh, I have not talked about this, but we can talk about it later. No. Hi. Uh, that, that one millisecond, how likely is that to change in the future? Will that become longer for storing uh, quantum information? Well, surely it will become better to store quantum information. I mean, actually, I certainly hope that eventually there will be some reasonable quantum memories. But note that there are two points, in fact, where noise can occur. Already, when I want to convert the state of a photonic qubit into an atomic ensemble, there can be some noise. So even if my memory would in the end be perfect, I would, would already have some noise. And in fact, um, by increasing the number of qubits that Alice sends to Bob, um, one can still obtain security in the setting. Of course, there's some theoretical limitations, but in most cases, this is still possible. Um, I mean, note that here, if I say that Bob can store some k times m qubits, or higher dimensional systems where m is the number of qubits transmitted from Alice to Bob, and k is some number, say two, which can be even larger or a half. Um, the quantum memories that exist today can store a small constant number of qubits. So in fact, in all cases known today, k is zero. Um, so there's no, no storage that scales for the number of qubits that we transmit. I mean, of course, it's an assumption, but I guess it's a realistic one for a long period of time. Um, um, this might be a little silly question because probably I missed the point, but uh, before you separate into two sets, into set A and B, yeah. um, Bob receives an average rating number of bits in, in a correct way, like he knows after um, he's told the encoding which ones are correct and which ones are incorrect. And then, since Bob doesn't communicate this information back, Alice decides on a set of an array of bits that falls into set A and one that falls into set B, and communicates this to Bob. So what if in both sets that, both, uh, that, that Bob receives the numbers of, um, he does not know all of the bits? Yeah, so of course that's a question. I mean, there is a protocol that does exactly what I've described that Bob so the, it's an interactive protocol in, called interactive hashing, where in fact, not Alice will decide how we're going to split these sets, but they will decide together. So, so this is the one point in the protocol where in fact Bob does communicate back to Alice. Yes, they communicate classically, I agree. I mean, I have glossed over this, um, but one can show that this kind of sampling 
is still secure. I have not talked about this. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, we just have time for the last question. Stephanie, nice primitive. Uh, could you tell us again what's, in your opinion, the single most practical application for this uh, protocol today? Well, I guess uh, the nicest primitive would be identification. Um, because, I mean, Job, for example, talked about all these attacks on smart cards and stuff, which are often used to carry public keys uh, for identification schemes or other things. Um, I think it would be kind of, okay, maybe I think it would be the coolest application. <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, that's what I, so identification I think is probably the most interesting application of this, say to a building. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Stephanie will be around for more questions and uh, we'll set up the next speaker. Thanks. <laughs>